Okay, so uh, all over the weekend and uh, since Monday when the Sir John story broke, I've seen on social media uh, some of our viewers wanting to find out how we're going to deal with this matter. And then uh, we put a photograph on our social media page this morning asking whether people are ready for Good Evening Ghana. The messages, as usual, were hilarious, but these two were quite interesting. Now, this guy has uh, Sir John's photograph over there pretending to be Sir John. And he says, Paul, try and defend me or give them touch screen tonight. If I'm well impressed, I owe you quarter plot. My wafasi will give it to you. I want to rest in peace. That's, <laughs> that's what social media has become. It's funny, but it's not funny. You know, that's what somebody says. Uh, Sir John is going to give me quarter plot uh, and his nephew. What's the guy's name again? The famous Charles Owusu. Uh, another person says he's going to watch us. Absolutely necessary. Okay, so where, where do we take this from? Um, when I saw the story, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, when I first saw the story, I said, wow, this is interesting. Now, my first port of call was the Ministry of Lands. So I quickly went to the Ministry of Lands people, and I said that the first thing that needs to be done, that you guys at Lands must confirm whether indeed a lease has occurred either from the Forestry Commission to the uh, to Sir John himself, as has been alleged, either to the Forestry Commission, to old family, to Sir John. What has happened? What? Let's get a documentation uh, to confirm what is in the, in the world that is going around. That was my first part of it. And then they told me that, well, many media houses have also come to them and asked them the same thing. So they were working on it. So yesterday, uh, we called them again, and they were still working on it. And so I was delighted when they issued the statement. Now, before we go to the Sir John will and all the things that we have to say, when I saw the statement from the Ministry of Lands, and that's, the st that's where I'm starting from uh, tonight, before we come to the broader conversation about the will, corruption, state capture, what is it, and, uh, and the politics of it as well. So this is, this is the statement that was I issued on 24th May uh, tonight uh, by the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. Achimota Forest stroke Kojo Usu Efriye's alleged last will and testament. Okay, so it goes as follows. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources refers to its press statement dated 22nd May 2022, in which the ministry committed to inquire into the allegations relating to the acquisition of parcels of land at the Achimota Forest and the Sakumono Ramsar site by the late former Chief Executive CEO of the Forestry Commission, Kwejo Owusu Efriye Sir John. Preliminary inquiries reveal that the alleged will in question is a subject of litigation contestation in the courts, further checks at the lands and the forestry commissions, the repositories of the records of the lands in question show no record of ownership of lands at the Achimota Forest or the Sakumono Ramsar site by the late Kojo Owusu Efriye. The statement continues. That said, given the totality of the circumstances of the said allegations, as Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, have directed the Lands and Forestry Commissions to deem any ownership of lands, both in the Achimota Forest and the Sakumono Ramsar site, by the late Kojo Usu Efriye as void and are to take the appropriate actions accordingly. And that's from the Minister for Lands. He continues and says, for the avoidance of doubt, the bequeathing of the aforesaid lands if established will not pass any interest title to the named beneficiaries in the alleged will. These lands, the subject matter of the alleged will, shall remain public lands, whether or not it falls within the degazetted lands pursuant to EI 144, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. So that was my starting point, that, well, we need, we need the government authority. Given all the circumstances and the conversation about Achimota Forest recently, we need the government authority to come and tell us that this is what has happened. And if it has actually happened, we need them to have the confidence to say that they will strike out that, those portions of their will. That, those were my, my fundamental interest in the matter when I looked at it. But then beyond that, we look at the, uh, the properties, the acquisitions of, of Sir John, and, and we can go through some of them. Uh, and, and they are here, uh, house on plot number, this located in Obojo, East Legon, acquired in 2018, they say. Uh, Oyarefa, acquired in September 2017. Oyarefa in Obojo, East Legon, by the way. Uh, plot number so, Adjuringano, they said it was in 2019. Some of them, they don't say. Six-bedroom house located at 
Pantambe Obojo, near East Legon. He does, they don't say when he acquires it. Then there's a four-bedroom house at East Legon, Mempasem. They don't say when, probably before 2017, I suspect. And then there's a three-bedroom plot on um, uh, Mempasem, East Legon. They don't say when it was acquired. Three-bedroom house uh, on, uh, also in Mempasem. John seems to like Mempasem. Where is Mempasem really? Somebody should to Mempasem, where East Legon, that, behind there somewhere? Oh, the university side. Ah, uh, Sir John seems to like me passing. <laughs> okay. Four bedroom house on the plot number East Legon acquired in October 2018. They write that one. And then a four bedroom house in Sakura, uh, Sakura Wono, his hometown. They don't say when he's acquired it. I'm sure way much earlier. It's a four story building located in East Legon with 10 apartments, each apartment consisting three bedrooms and five bedroom apartments, each consisting two bedrooms. They don't say when he gets it. Uh, two plots of land located at Ahima, Ahima Kokobi in the Ashanti region. They don't say when he acquires it. Two plots of land, registration number located in Oyarefa. Uh, acres of land in Achimota Forest. Those are the issues. One, one in Achimota Forest and then another acres of land in Achimota Forest held in the name of uh, Faso Limited. And then an unspecified piece of land, again, Achimota Forest and uh, the DML connection. And all of those things, all of the... There are 57 different items, including bank accounts and investment, all of that. I've seen that. If you exclude Achimota Forest and the other one, this is a nearly 70-year-old man, isn't he? Sir John was a nearly 70-year-old man. What did he, do, did he do in his lifetime up to 2017? If we look at what he did in his lifetime up to 2017, the allegations of corruption has to be looked at again so that a man cannot acquire property, the one he acquired in his hometown in Kumasi and all of that. I think that's conversation number one. Because there are people, politicians in the same state as Sir John, who walked away from school and started political jobs, like minister, deputy minister, straight from university. They have acquired significant property in Accra. Should we go through all of that? I'm not interested in that. I'm not, we, we think, the people like us, we think that the whole national conversation is about amending the constitution. Forgive us for thinking we are myopic, but we believe that once the superstructure is set out, everything will follow. So we don't do the micro nick and pick how many properties has he got. If you take this car from this one, this one will come and take it. You take this house from this one, this one will come and take it until you change the superstructure. So that's what we've been canvassing. Let's look at the constitution and amend the constitution. Why does the president have excessive powers? Why must he appoint this, appoint that? Can we have another look at it? We think if that is done, everything will follow through. But other people think differently. So we are not concerned about that. But if we were to be concerned about the micro details and go into this matter, you will see that you think that Sir John matter is worse. No, they are, they are more brutal ones of people who are 27, come to begin with, they are staying at Airport Hills, buying property for millions of dollars. Never worked before. Never ever worked before. They are there. So, but I'm not interested. I leave that for those who want to do the, the little pieces. If you look at Sir John's life, and you look at how he ended up. Why is, why is it surprising that he has the kinds of things he has? Barring the ones he took from Achimota Forest, which would be a clear case of conflict of interest, where he's forestry commission, and then it is a forestry commission matter, and then he takes it. But even the ones he acquired while he was a public officer. When J.A. Kufo was leaving government, he was asked questions about how he feels the government should continue it. When they were doing the constitutional amendment, they went to see him. He talked about a few things. The other thing, one of the most important things he said is that we have to begin a serious conversation about how are we going to reward, assess, and categorize public office holders whose signature becomes important. And we've had this conversation several times. So you have a minister of petroleum, minister of energy, his salary is 10,000, but he's approving $200 million projects. What kind of a person should you take to that position so that we know that this minister of energy has come through this level so we know that he will go behave himself? Or we say that if you meet a certain budget like they did in Singapore under Lin Kuan Yu, you're a minister of energy, your budget is 5 million. If you can turn the budget to 15 million as in revenue for the ministry, you get a certain percent of the money. Lee Kuan Yew did that. So he was able to bring a lot of clever Singaporeans from all over the world back to work in Singapore. If you are Minister of Finance and you come and the borrowing rate is this and the, 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 the debt to GDP ratio is this, if by the time you are living as Minister of Finance, you have bought the debt to GDP ratio so low and you have saved the country X amount of money, we will give you $7 million. Should we begin to have a conversation like that as J.A. Kofor was recommending or should we continue and, and pretend 
that the Minister of Finance, when he has his discretion, and in exercise of his discretion, he favors a company, the company can come back to him and say, thank you. Do we know that? And if the company comes and says thank you in, in the form of $3 million, is it good? Is it bad? Is it wrong? Will they continue? Will it stop? Who is going to stop it? Because as ministers and CEOs, they exercise a discretion. That discretion can favor somebody. It can favor me. It can favor you. It can favor your uncle. Uncle becomes an endangered species of word. This is an, it's an endangered species as a word, uncle. Okay. They can favor your uncle, your, your offer. It can favor your, your somebody. That person who is favored, in, who goes to the tender, and at the end of the tender, the ministry decides that both companies are qualified. But the minister says, I like this person, or I know him, or he's a party person. And then he exercises his discretion legitimately in favor of that person. The person comes back to give to the minister X amount of money because the contract was X amount. What are we, what's, what's the conversation about that? I think that that's the real conversation. And from my side, we think that the solution to the conversation is to have a thinking through process as a developing country can go the Lee Kuan Yew way. Where ministers know that at another year they are going to earn $500,000 because they've been able to achieve the threshold set for them by a certain committee. Every minute. And those who are not able to achieve the threshold, they will also have some, some demerits. They get sagged and this and that and that. We need to have a serious conversation, ladies and gentlemen, about the future of our country. And it has to do with the document called the Constitution. So Sir John becomes forestry commission boss. Definitely, he's going to exercise his discretion for one person or the other person. For somebody to be able to do rosewood in this community, but you cannot do wawa in this community. All of that legitimately is given to him as the CEO to exercise his discretion. If in doing so, in exercising his discretion, those beneficiaries say, come and take a house at Obojo. And he takes the house at Obojo in 2017. Another person that he's exercised discretion in favor, some of the discretion he exercises is going to benefit the forestry commission but it was his signature that made the determination these are the realities of the situation because his signature determines the situation he gets something back the person comes and says i'll give you two houses in somewhere is it good is it bad is it corruption is it state capture will it stop who is going to stop it that's the conversation we need to have. And that's what I see about the Sir John thing. Excluding Achimota Forest and the Ramsar site, everything else in there, we can have a conversation about it. You can call it corruption, but look at it within the context of the reality of the things that happen in ministerial offices every day. That's been happening all the time. And I told you about some people who came from school. You, you may find them in both parties who have, are able to buy a million dollar property. I've just he's never worked before they've been in politics for nine years they've never worked before they are there i'm not interested in whether it's bad or good i think that if we need to move forward as a country we have a conversation and fix the superstructure so who is sir john who is he let's let's come to that okay so he's here Kojo Usufriye Sir John had humble beginnings he was born into a devout sda family in sakura wono in 1952 his father died in 1962. So when his father died, he was 10 years old. And his mother died four years later in 1966. His uncle, ah, there you go. Maybe you see where this Wafa thing is coming from. In the life of the man himself, it appeared that his uncle had a significant role in his life. His mother died when he was 10. His father died when he was 10. His mother died four years later. He was 14. Then it says his uncle, a successful industrialist and cocoa farmer in his day, Kweku Yao, as affectionately called, saw a bright spark in the young Kojo Usuefriye and was a significant funding source for his primary and early secondary education. Kweku uh, Yao passed away in 1972 and Sir John was effectively left to fend for himself. It goes on. Academically, Sir John excelled in the arts, specifically literature, history, philosophy, Latin, and economics. He studied, he attended Bekwai SDA, SHS, on scholarship, where his contemporaries included Dr. K.K. Sapon, now formerly of GMPC, is going to be a chief soon. Uh, Sir John read economics at Bekwai SDA and once again excelled. In the intervening years between Bekwai SDA and Sith Form at Konongo Dumase, Sir John weaved Kinte to make ends meet and taught part-time at Konongo Dumase sixth form before gaining admission to the University of Ghana where he pursued economics and law, then later the bar at Makola. 
Okay, let's move on. Sir John was called to the Ghana by 1981. Sir John's political activism preceded Lagon, but intensified during their champion years. He led student movements at the university, and his love for politics and galvanizing people was a God-given gift, as his contemporaries fondly recall. He became the SRC president for John Mainsan Saba Hall. In the early 1980s, Sir John practiced as a young barrister in Kejetia. So you remember the Kejetia properties and all the Kejetia. Now I'm going back to show that this man has done, done a lot of work in his life. And so he's able to acquire property except those that he acquires by his own hand, taken from state and given to himself. And with the Ministry of Lands is assuring us that as far as they are concerned, nothing of the sort has happened. But if it happens, they have enough power to stop it. Okay, let's move on. Sir John practiced as a barrister in KJTR. He departed for the United Kingdom, London, specifically in 1985, to pursue the English bar and to broaden his professional practice. During his years in the United Kingdom, he was a cornerstone member of the Dankwa Fund Club and was a founding member of the NPP UK. He worked as a housing officer and legal consultant in several London boroughs, including Slough, Croydon, Redbridge, and Bohamwood. His contemporaries included Aprechum Sapon and Hayford Atakrufi, who are still big law firms in the United Kingdom. Sir John, is a, is, is, it says, had a private immigration practice that gave hundreds of Ghanaians the rights to abode and citizenship in the United Kingdom. So he became a very popular barrister in London in the days when immigration was a big story in the 1990s. At the collapse of the Berlin Wall, Europe was re reuniting. So at that time, immigration was a big deal. And that's where the story says, in those days, uh, in London, Sir John was a toast of the Ghanaians doing immigration cases for them. He set up an immigration law firm in London. Th those were the very lucrative jobs you could get in London as a young man working as a barrister in those days because the big cases go to the white lawyers, the British lawyers. But for a Ghanaian, Nigerian, Ugandan, you set up an immigration practice that's successful. You are getting people's passports and visa for them. They like you and they used to charge them a lot of money for it. Okay, so this is what Sir John used to do in the United Kingdom. Let's move on. He also championed human rights and fought for Ghanaians and Africans in immigration detention centers across the United Kingdom. In, two, in 2002, at the invitation of His Excellency J.A. Kofor, Sir John returned to Ghana to take a post as a Deputy Director Legal and Administration at the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation. I'm, I bet many people didn't know that. So Sir John in 2002 was appointed by President Kofor to be the uh, Director Legal at the, at the uh, GMPC. During his almost three years stint at GMPC, he rose to become the director of legal and worked closely with the late M.O. Boateng. Sir John contested the old Tafu primaries in 2004 against the then Deputy Minister of Finance, Anthony Akotose, losing marginally by less than 10 votes to Akotose. Sir John established a private legal practice under the trading name Sir John Law Firm in Edum Kumasi in the intervening period. He championed human rights issues, particularly his stellar work on our prison's reform. He was known as the MPP lawyer and effectively handled most cases pro bono. Alongside his professional legal practice, he acted as a consultant for many prominent companies in Ghana as an external corporate affairs resource. Sir John tried his hand at many businesses, including a transport and logistics company he established in Kumasi in 2005. In 2010, he ran for and was duly elected as the NPP's general secretary until his mandate was not renewed in 2014 in a highly acrimonious election that set the tone for election 2016. Sir John went back into consultancy 2014, but was equally committed to the new patriotic party. In March 2017, President Akufado appointed Sir John as the CEO of the Forestry Commission. He passed away on Republic Day, 1st July 2020. So that's the story of the man. That's the, that's the story of the man. This is the Sir John story. So with a story like that, he will have some acquisitions. With a story like that, he will have some possessions. And then he became a public official in 2017. And the part of the conversation I want us to drive, not, not today we might not have time for that, but we need to run this conversation based on what President Kofor said and based on our own admonitions at constitutional reforms. What do we do with the CEO of Forestry Commission? First of all, should we state in the law a qualification that limits it to delimit the people who are qualified to become anything that president is appointing, including Forestry Commission? Because as at this stage, there's not much. It's just ordinarily qualified to be a member of parliament. That's all. It doesn't say anything about background. 
There, there, are, there are good things in that one, but what should we do with it? That's a conversation we should have. And if somebody becomes a forestry commission boss, how much should we pay him? How much gifts can he take? How much gifts can he not take? What should we say about it? I think that's a conversation we should have. There are those who believe that this, is, this Sir John thing creates a political advantage for them and uh, it makes their political party look better than the NPP, which is Sir John's party. And, and they are excited about that and they think that it's going to have some effect on some election, something like that. No, fair enough. That's political. It's fine. But beyond that, there are those who are disappointed in the NPP and they think this is going to affect fortunes and all that. All of that is fine. Beyond that, as young people who want to have a serious nation by the time we are done, should we not have this conversation within the context of the constitutional amendment? That's the only way. We can expose these things. You see, that's the point I make all the time. This exposure doesn't take our country anywhere. It makes some newspaper popular and it makes some individual popular and he exposes it. But he's collapsing the superstructure. We are not interested in the micro expositions. Let us have a conversation about the superstructure. Which clauses should we amend in the constitution to give us a society that is real? honest and modern because right now we are dishonest that's what president Kofo meant about the salaries of public officials it's total dishonesty and we sit down and you're telling as i said the minister of health is going to sign out contracts using his discretion in many of the instances at least 30 percent of his discretion almost always he is going to do favors to people the people are going to come back to him they're going to give him money they're going to give him property and all of that that's what has happened. That's the reality. Let's not be hypocrites to that. Now, if we are not hypocrites to that, then if Sir John in 2018 acquires a house in Ogojo, Pillar 2 or, or Mimpasem, having exercised his discretion for somebody, is that corruption? I'm not saying it is or that it is not. I'm asking, is it corruption? Let's have a conversation about that. That's the moral of the Sir John story. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Lands uh, sort of issued a statement that ran us through uh, most of the things that we've been talking about. Let's have a look at it quickly. Uh, they're going to put it there. Let's have a look at it very quickly and then we can end this conversation. Uh, because, okay, so that's uh, um, the Ministry of Lands statement. So it goes through all the way. Uh, about the process of acquiring the Achimota forest. And then in clause 7, it says, it was recommended following these consultations that due to the choked nature of the current Accra Central Business District and the reconstruction of the Tetekwashi Halam Motorway, a portion of the land forming the part of the 1927 acquisition of Achimota Forest should be redeveloped as a complementary business district to facilitate the decongestion of the Accra Central Business District. An appropriate uh, benefit determined and accordingly extended to the old family while at the same time preserving the Achimota Forest. So that's where this, this sort of conversation begins. We're going back to Achimota Forest now. A statement said that the place was going to be looked at as a business center, like a, a, a central business district from Accra. You know that in parts of in London, for instance, you have Regent Street, Mayfair, you have other places in America, New York, you have different places all within the city. So they were looking about another sort of business district like Accra, which is really a good idea, isn't it? And then they, if, we have re, if we have trains, they can do a train station right where they've done the bus terminal. So that kind of works, isn't it? Okay. But that's the, where the story sort of starts. Then he continues to say, pursuant to this recommendation, government acting by the Minister for Lands, Forestry, and uh, Honorable Cecilia Dapa did something. They did something, 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 something until the 2008. The committee noted that although the land had been granted to the family exceeding the original 90 acres agreed in 2008, it was a fair compromise. Because they agreed on 90 acres, Minister Inu Safuseni exceeded it. They agreed on 90 acres for the uh, old family. Minister Yunus Afuseni exceeded. But the committee said it was okay. So they moved on. And then uh, there's 2013. On 20th March 2013, the family again petitioned the then president, John Dramani Mahama, for the release of portions of land. Desirous of converting the forest reserve into an eco park, a concept which was conceived sometime in 2011, the then minister for lands and natural resources, Yunus Afuseni, constituted a strategic development committee chaired by the then Deputy Minister for Lands, uh, Barbara Sewa Asamoa, to develop a strategy and roadmap for this one. Um, okay, the committee, as part of his work, considered a few things, etc., etc. Let's run through it very quickly. And then uh, uh, the uh, Afaridate Committee recommended the release of an acreage of 118 on the 30th of September 2013, the Forestry Commission executed three leases in favor of the old family, totaling 140.411 acres. That's 148. That's what was released uh, under President Mahama in 2013. Uh, these are the leases that were granted. 
and this in a statement. And then uh, President Akufuado also did something. The said deed, to, uh, the, the, by the said deed of 2014, deed of variation, the Forestry Commission granted the old family another 50.0 acres, bringing the total acreage that was given under President Mahama to 198. Um, okay, so then President Akufuado comes and declassifies it so that they can own and have their own land. Uh, by the negotiation between the Forestry Commission and the old family culminated in the deed of variation executed in 2020, varying the schedules to the 2013 leases. By this deed of variation, the total area of land released to the old family was 312 um, acres. This is the negotiation that Sir John may have participated in, the negotiation uh, with the Forestry Commission leading up to 2020. Uh, so maybe, so they said there was a negotiation. So maybe the negotiation was in 2020 with the Forestry Commission. In the negotiation, the old family may have promised him something because they gave to the old family and they gave it to back to their, they, they may give, have given it back to him. And that's why it's registered in the name of DML or some company like that. Is that corruption? Is that sin? Is that evil? That's, this is, a, this is con pure conjecture at this stage. I don't know. I'm just saying that given the dates of the, uh, of the, uh, of the occurrences of these things, uh, John definitely participated in that negotiation. Could it be that he was promised something within the context of the negotiation? I didn't know if he was. Is it sin? Is it wrong? Is it evil? Is it? Yeah, let's, let's deal with it. Okay. On the 17th of December 2020, the family wrote to the Forestry Commission requesting for expedited action on the degazetting of the portions of the forest. And so, President Akufuado executed uh, those documents in 2022. And there, there was the declassification. But of course, in, in the EI-154, President Akufuado insisted that the rest of the Achimota forest, what is the original forest, apart from the peripheral land, the rest of it shall remain a forest. And we understand that on the 10th of June, the Minister of Lands is going to lead uh, some important people from the minority side in Parliament and the majority side to plant trees there. So that's our take on Sir John. Everyone was waiting, was waiting for it. That's our take on Sir John. May he rest in perfect peace. May we use this opportunity to see how we move our country forward. Those who think it's political advantage, good luck. Those who think it's political disadvantage, better luck next time. That's our story. That's our song. Sister.